Our first three speakers <clears throat> have taken us to different latitudes here in the Americas. <clears throat> now we are going to swing across the Atlantic Ocean to Africa. Dr. Babatunde Lawal is a professor of art history at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. <clears throat> he specializes in African and African diaspora art with personal research focus on the ancient and contemporary arts of Nigeria, particularly the visual culture of the Yoruba and its influences in the Americas. His publications on Yoruba art examine its ontological, social, cultural, religious, and aesthetic implications, as well as the dynamics of change. Much of his data derives from formal and iconographic analyses, reinforced with field interviews and from the Odu Ifa, a collection of origin myths, astronomical speculations, philosophical commentaries, and remedies handed down from the past, and often referenced by Yoruba diviners to help clients in times of crisis. As we will learn, cultural astronomy looms large in Yoruba culture and art being used for a variety of purposes such as social control, measuring time, determining direction, coping with the vicissitudes of the existential process, and most importantly, reinforcing their belief in life after death. Dr. Lawal's presentation is titled, A Big Calabash with Two Halves, The Yoruba Vision of the Cosmos. Please welcome Baba Tunde Lawal. <laughs> Thank you. So here's your clock. Oh, okay. about 25 after. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Smithsonian Institution for inviting me to participate in this uh, symposium. Well, uh, I'll go straight to the topic. As is well known, cultural astronomy is a co complex uh, subject. It is much more than an inquiry into the nature and significance of heavenly bodies. It also entails the use of celestial observations for measuring time, controlling human behavior, as well as for creating ritual and agricultural calendars, among others. In addition, cultural astronomy is dif in different parts of the world has given rise to a variety of cosmological speculations and belief systems, all aimed at giving life meaning, and purpose. My presentation today examines this phenomenon among the Yoruba of West Africa and how they use it through the visual and performing arts to educate the public, measure time, determine direction, cope with the existential process, and above all, reinforce their quest for eternal life. Numbering more than 25 million people, the Yoruba are found in present-day republics of Nigeria, Benin, and Togo. Most of them live in southwestern Nigeria, divided into numerous kingdoms. Major towns are headed by monarchs, Oba, who claim descent from Odudua, a divine ancestor often identified as the first king of Ilefe, the ancient city widely venerated as the cradle of Yoruba culture and where the world was created. Hence, the popular saying, Ife Oye, Ibiojumo Timowa, Ife, the land of sunrise. By the beginning of uh, the second millennium of the, of the common era, Ilefe had become a major urban center with highly sophisticated religious, social, and political institutions. In fact, there are monoliths for measuring time, and we have Professor Willett of Cambridge. You know, it's a site of uh, intensive archaeological uh, work. The city is world famous for its uh, arts, whose style varies from the naturalistic to the highly stylized, all reflecting a period, in fact, the date between the 11th and the 17th centuries, 
all ref reflecting a period of advanced cultural and economic development. As in other parts of uh, Africa, the Yoruba have uh, astronomers and astrologers called uh, Ojogbon. These are philosophers, our, our star, you know, star readers, Adamushe, occultists. They are professional diviners, revered as keepers of Yoruba divination narratives called Oduifa, comprising creation stories, details of time-honored rituals, quasi-historical accounts often cited to relate the past to the present in the attempt to predict or solve uh, problems. Scholars of Yoruba history, art, religion, and cultural astronomy are fortunate in that several volumes of Oduifa have been published for teaching and research uh, purposes. In fact, uh, even in the Americas here, there are institutions helping to advance the knowledge of IFA. In fact, in 2005, UNESCO recognized IFA divination practice among the Yoruba as a world uh, heritage. My interpre interpretation of Yoruba cosmology has benefited immensely, not only from Oduifa, but also from Yoruba oral traditions, as well as interviews with indigenous astrologers, and from my own research. It is worth mentioning that Yoruba oral traditions include special terms, an aphorism for theorizing and interpreting the visual and performing arts. A review of Yoruba cosmology reveals a strong belief in a supreme creator called Olodumare, the eternal one or the ultimate cause, the, generation, the generator of Ashe. Ashe is a vital force or power that enables the sun to shine, the moon and stars to glitter, the wind to blow, the rain to fall, and the river to flow. It gives form to the formless, motion to the motionless, and life to living things. It is present in all phenomena, both animate and inanimate. This power sustains the cosmos, which the Yoruba conceptualize as the big calabash with two halves, Igban Lameji, Sojuderaun, also called Igbaiwa, the calabash of existence. The top half signifies sky or heaven or no, the spirit world and the domain of Olodumare, also known as Alashe, the source of Ashe. The bottom half of the calabash represents the primeval waters out of which the physical world was later created. Unlike the creator deities in other African cultures, the Yoruba supreme creator does not act directly, but makes things happen through a host of spirits and nature forces called Orisha. Each Orisha personifies a natural or cultural phenomenon. Thus, Obatala exemplifies creativity, Ishwelegba communication, Arumila divination, knowledge, wisdom, Odudua, the divine king, and so on and so forth. In fact, technology is also personified, agriculture. All these elements are personified to facilitate some kind of communication between the human and the superhuman and in the process, you know, enable the Yoruba to influence and manipulate uh, the forces of nature. As the story goes, in the beginning, only water existed below the sky, that is, in the bottom half of the calabash of existence. 
Olod Mary later gave Odudua a sacred bird and a bag of sand with which to transform the primeval waters into habitable land. This is, the one on the right is a contemporary interpretation of this uh, creation myth. Odudua descended from the sky, poured the sand on the primeval waters, and released the bird to spread the sand, eventually creating land. The Yoruba term, Okun Daye, that is, the ocean turned into land, commemorates this event. In view of its uh, participation in creation, the bird motif features prominently in Yoruba rituals as a power symbol. And one can see the messengerial function of the bird here because it commutes between heaven and earth. It is seen as uh, a symbol of ritual agency. The chameleon is another important uh, creature in Yoruba cosmology. For it was the chameleon that Olodumare reportedly asked to go and ascertain if the newly created land was solid enough for human occupation. No wonder the chameleon signifies clairvoyance, caution, immunity, and a metaphysical capacity to survive against all odds, among others. Hence, its motif has a talismanic significance in Yoruba rituals and headdresses. After receiving reports that the newly created land below the sky was ready for occupation, the Supreme Being commissioned the creativity deity of Batala to mold the first human images from clay. The images were then infused with ashe, or a soul, or different souls, and subsequently placed inside the lower female half of the cosmic calabash, symbolizing the womb, to be delivered by pregnant women. As a result, at times, when, some women, are anxious, when women are anxious to have children, they are advised to go and get dolls to implore Obatala to give them a child. In fact, uh, the creation of the body by Obatala is commemorated in the name Oshashono. The deity created a work of art. So there's an attempt here to trace the origin of artistic creativity among humans to the spiritual. As a result, the body is perceived by the Yoruba as a work of art that makes the soul manifest in the physical world, defining individual existence, Iwa. So one can see some kind of correlation between the body and a work of art. But to the Yoruba, it is much more than flesh, bones, and blood. It signifies the self in various uh, ways. As a result of the Yoruba, earthly life is an interface of spirit and matter, a kind of performance in time and space during which, during which the body articulates in the individual existence in response to the rhythm generated by the soul. According to one divination text, Ifa Irosu, on the origin of the universe, the Yoruba word for humanity, Enyo, is an abbreviation of that is the Homo sapiens. That is those specially commissioned by Lord Mary to transform the primeval wilderness below the sky 
into an orderly estate. In other words, or in effect, the word in here not only identifies the human body as a divinely inspired intelligent form, it also implies that the capacity to create and appreciate art is an integral part of humanity, accounting for the aesthetic impulses in poetry, music, dress, pottery, sculptures, and other forms of material culture. Now, it is worth mentioning that some of the Orishas, including Obatala, the artist deity, allegedly assumed the same human body in order to accompany the first mortals to the earth. In fact, Ogun, the deity of uh, tools and weapons, is said to have led the way, that is the first mortals and other deities, using it is machete to cut a path through the primordial jungle, laying the foundation for Yoruba culture and civilization. In fact, during festival for Ogun, you see priests using you know, the machete as though clearing path, creating civilization. So the popular name Ogunlano commemorates this event in short, all the principal Yoruba Orisha allegedly contributed significantly to the transformation of the earth into the civilization it has, be it has become today. Besides, some Orisha allegedly became rulers of certain towns during their sojourn on earth, intermarrying with humans who now venerate them as divine ancestors. Other deities miraculously disappeared, leaving behind figurative uh, and non-figurative uh, symbols for communicating with them in the spirit world. These legends soon gave rise to a tendency among the Yoruba to identify cultural heroes on the grounds that they are supernatural beings temporarily incarnated in human forms to facilitate direct interaction with mortals. So it is that some Yoruba deities are personified in art and altars. Others can be embodied through spirit uh, mediumship. Now, the popular Yoruba saying, Aye Lodja or Runile, the world is a market. Heaven is home, throws more light on the Yoruba concept of humanity. It connotes the, de the descent of an embodied soul from heaven to participate metaphorically in a business venture on earth, which will end at death. However, to the Yoruba, death, Iku, is not the end of life, but rather a kind of disembodiment of the soul and its return home to heaven, where it may reincarnate as a newborn baby to start a new life on earth. For instance, uh, whenever children are born immediately after the death of uh, grandparents, they are named after those gran grandparents, being perceived as those grandparents reincarnated. For instance, my own name, Babatunde, means father returns, implying that my grandfather has reincarnated in me. If a woman, Yetunde, mother returns. On the other hand, the symbolic equation of the marketplace with the physical world derives in part from the deification or identification of the earth as a goddess who provides the bulk of the raw materials that sustains a culture's economy. While men are in charge, often in charge of production, especially of crops and livestock, women dominate retail business. As Margaret Drural points out, women control the central market and its 
as administrative head holds a position in the King's Council of Chiefs. In effect, the marketplace metaphor in Yoruba culture identifies earthly existence as a complex web of social interactions and negotiations, a kind of business venture that requires an individual to develop special skills so as to make life profitable. The emphasis on the head, Ori, in Yoruba visual culture, deserves special attention here. It reflects a strong belief that the head is to the body what a king is to a kingdom, and by extension, what the supreme being is to the cosmos, a source of power. Moreover, the head of an individual is thought to have uh, two aspects. The physical head, that is the visible one, which identifies the self, and the metaphysical head, the seat of the soul, that not only empowers existence, but also enables certain individuals, especially diviners, to de develop extraterrestrial perceptions reflected in cultural astronomy. No, needless to say, success in life also depends on how well one is able to make good use of one's head. No wonder in the past, sorry, adults uh, Yoruba were expected to dedicate an altar to their inner head. Which look as, because uh, this inner head localizes the ashe, connecting the individual to the, to the supreme uh, God. Note the recurrence of the cone motif in Yoruba visual culture. Because it denotes the epical position of the head on the human body and in the cosmos. To the Yoruba, the top of the cone in, you know, connotes the cutting edge that the head provides in solving problems or negotiation, or neg negotiating the vicissitudes of life. In fact, the Yoruba adage says, Ori le jafin labu, it is with the head that the fish cuts through the deep. It is with the head that the bird you know, moves through the sky. May my head continue to guide me. Of course, the head is the seat of the brain, which enables humanity to observe and study the sky and use the knowledge for various purposes. In fact, uh, the gurus at NASA have uh, special heads that enable them to develop uh, all kinds of gadgets. And uh, so, so note the importance of the head. Now, most, while most uh, divine, divination verses are silent on how the sun or, and the moon came into being, Nonetheless, they identify sun and the moon as children of the great mother called Yemaja. The sun is regarded as male and moon, female, the latter being associated with the menstrual cycle in Koshu. Hence, during the waxing phase of the moon, maidens and newly married women pray to the moon to bless them with children. Moreover, certain rituals called ajidewe, that is wake up and feel younger, are performed during the waxing phase of the moon to promote longevity and prosperity. Hence the popular saying, lotun lotun la boshu, as fresh 
as the new moon. So these rituals associated with the moon easily explain the frequency of the crescent motif in Yoruba art, as one can see here. The stars are perceived as children of the sun and moon. There are stories of frequent conflict in the past between both, resulting in solar and lunar eclipses. As cultural geographer Afalabi Ojo explains, in order to reduce such conflicts between the sun and the moon to the barest minimum, Olodumare separated them, allocating to the sun the day and to the moon the night. Each has since been supreme in its own territory and period. As the sky belonged to the moon during the night, the sun stole back in a flash from the west to east at midnight in order to get ready the following day. The moon, in a similar manner, assumed its position in the sky at midday when the sun was too much engaged to have time to interfere. The seasonal irregularities in the sun's nightly return flight resulted in clashes with the moon, eclipse of the moon, and so on and so forth. So these solar and lunar movements are associated with the cardinal points, the east implying sunrise, the noon, north, you know, the north, you know, midday, and so on and so forth. And then the south, we have west, sunset, and then the south associated with the night, the transition, you know, and so on and so forth. At the same time, the cardinal directions are associated with major deities. As a result, you know, time can be calculated on the basis of the appearance of the sun and the moon. In fact, uh, in many parts of Ife, there are monoliths you know, dating back to the 11th century allegedly used to determine you know, the directions of the sun as well as shadows. In fact, a German uh, explorer visiting Ife around 1910 was told how the shadows were interpreted along with the cries of certain birds to the time, determine time. The diurnal movements of sun and moon also determined the four days of the Yoruba week in the past. And then these days are associated with uh, various uh, deities or uh, Orisha, and so on and so forth. Admit admittedly, Yoruba oral tradition are vague on the topography of the top half of the Calabash, Arno. yet there is a strong belief that it has many layers, about seven, and that the supreme being occupies the topmost one. In the lower half dwell the deities of, that is heaven, the celestial beings, souls of deceased ancestors, while the bottom half represents the domain of the earth goddess. In fact, the middle portion, portion here is called the Leaye, the world of the living. So the Yoruba landscape is divided into three parts. You have uh, residential areas called Ilu. That is the cultivated land. Then you have adjacent farms, Oko, part of the ordered uh, sphere. And then we have uh, the wilderness, a kind of terra incognita, 
occupied by all kinds of uh, spirits. The existence of lagoons and lakes here and there on the surface of the earth has given rise to a popular belief that the landscape floats on a body of water, accessible through wells and other holes. In fact, the Yoruba speculate that there is a big river underground that souls of the dead must cross on their way to heaven. As a result, whenever somebody dies, that person is said to have crossed the river. The rainbow deity, the celestial snake, is said to connect the earthly river to the sky, helping to recycle water that falls as rain from the sky. And it is this water that helps to sustain the physical world as a commercial center. In fact, one can see here emphasis on the rainbow. The rainbow is associated with prosperity because of that and so on. Now, there is a problem here because uh, in Yoruba cosmology, there is a belief that uh, the world is uh, a complex of opposing forces. In fact, uh, the first and second speakers mentioned opposing forces in the universe. In fact, the Yoruba perception of the eclipse as a conflict between the sun and sky is part of this widespread belief. So what we see here, there's a belief, kind of oppositional complementarity of sun, sun and moon, day and night, hot and cold, wet and dry, visible and invisible, all complementing one another. Hence, there's this popular saying, tibitire la dale aye, that is, the world is sustained by good and evil. And inu uh, kokodudu, like it is out of a black pot that the white porridge comes out. In other words, you use a black pot to, pr to cook and make white porridge. The implication here, apart from signifying that good things can come out of a bad event and vice versa, it also relates night to daylight, because daylight comes out of the night. No wonder Yoruba cosmology has forces associated with those of the right and those of the left. Those of the left are associated with evil, and those of the right with good, and so on and so forth. So there are all kinds of implications for this. As a result of that, there is a belief that there are certain deities created by Olodumare to reconcile these forces that are in perpetual opposition to one another, part of a dualism. And one of the deities associated with this balancing act is Eshu, Elegba, the divine messenger, who is associated with the crossroads. And then we have uh, Ifa, associated with divination to help uh, humans to, to find problems, uh, to find solutions to problems. So Eshu is frequently represented as double-faced, emphasizing its ability to negotiate with the forces of good and those of evil. It's also associated with the crossroad because it links the north to the south, east and west. And one can see this uh, metaphor in some of Eshu's symbols you know, with three or four figures. The other deity is Ifa, the deity of wisdom. In fact, uh, Ifa sort of uh, signifies the intelligence of the supreme being. And then note you know, four figures here alluding to the cardinal points in addition to Eshu. So the interaction of Ifa and Eshu, especially during the divination process, 
has allowed humans to find problems, to uh, find solutions to all kinds of uh, problems. And we see here those individuals who specialize in the knowledge of the cosmos using divination tray to help find uh, these solutions. So the divination tray comes in various sizes. The round or circular ones evoke uh, the calabash, the cosmic calabash. The semicircular divination trays may either signify the upper half or the lower half, and then we have a rectangular or square calabash you know, representing the four corners of the world. In this 18th century divination board, we see a combination of the circular and the rectangular to emphasize the interconnectedness of heaven and earth. So this is the diviner trying to communicate with uh, the other worldly. And then note the faces alluding to the cardinal points. In fact, the center of the divination board connects heaven and earth. In fact, in some more recent uh, interpretation of the divination board, you can see the star in the center, so that the center mirrors the world above. And the face is, say, is said to represent that of the divine messenger who communicates messages you know, from heaven to earth and vice versa. So this is uh, a priest or a divination priest. Again, note the recurrence of the bird motif on that. Another important deity in Yoruba cosmology is Shango, associated with the thunderstorm and social justice. And note the double axe aspect of Shango, representing the interaction of male and female in the cosmos, because uh, life sort of uh, depends on this uh, interface. And Shango is also associated with the positive and negative. Through rainfall, agriculture is possible. But the same rainfall is attended by lightning that can lead to the destruction of life and property. In fact, uh, one can see the allusion to fire from the sky descending into the earth, the body of Mother Earth, uh, the Earth Goddess. And then during the thunderstorm, certain lamps may be lit in an attempt to control you know, the movement of Shango across the sky. Because when there is lightning, Shango is said to be riding fire like a horse. So there's an attempt to control this control also entails the use of the human body to manifest the power and presence of Shango. Note how even male priests braid their hair. And uh, the implication here is that uh, you are trying to femaleize the, female, you know, the male body to make it as powerful spiritually as that of women, because women use their body to mediate souls of babies from heaven to earth. And uh, the power with which they, were able, they are able to procreate is different from muscular power. So that we begin to see how men try to acquire certain aspects of female power in an attempt to mediate, use their body to mediate this powerful deity without uh, sustaining serious injury. Note the color of Shango, red, associated with fire. Fire can be negative when it burns the body or burns uh, the environment, but can be positive when it is used for cooking. Fire, you know, red is also associated with the blood, you know, with, uh, uh, with blood which invigorates uh, the body. In fact, Shango can manifest in the body of a priest. And note the use of blue associated with uh, water, red, fire, white, spirituality. 
And one can see here, the Agbeno is a male priest with braided hair to signify the descent of fire from the sky to be absorbed by Mother Earth. And then the movement of, of the flame is associated with Oya, the tornado goddess who collaborates with Shango during a thunderstorm. In fact, the Yoruba believe that without Oya, the female partner of Shango, Shango is powerless. So we begin to see this emphasis on the complementarity of the male and the female. Note the fan motif here. Because Oya has a major influence on Shango, she's able to either use the fan to cool Shango's temper, or at the same time use that fan to infuriate Shango. So one can see this elephant and this emphasis on duality, you know, dualism in Shango art. So one can see the correspondence between the thunderbolt born by the priest with the fire. This is fire, this is fire. The container here is also trying to contain Shango's uh, power. And then one can see the duality here. Shango is also believed to have the power to punish offenders and then reward uh, well, those who are righteous. And finally, we look at earth goddess who controls the market. The, there, is a mem there is a society called the Boni. Individuals, you know, men and women, who have attained uh, distinguished positions in their professions, they become members of this society. They call themselves Omoya, children of the same mother. Even though the earth is perceived as female, most of the altars have male and um, female figures, implying that uh, she has the earth has uh, elements of maleness and femaleness, metaphysically, not in the way we identify gender in the physical world. The male and female aspect also signify the ability of the mother to reward, because the female body is soft, associated with motherhood, and then the male punishment, hardness. So in Yoruba culture, female, Gentility, man, forceful. So we see these two elements you know, combined, and then you can see some, ima you know, some images of the mother earth with two faces, one male, punish the other female. And then this is the symbol of members called a dog boni. In a boni formula, one plus one may equal three. Because a male and a female is conjoined by the presence of Mother Earth, the invisible witness to human dealings. So we can see these elements. And then this is a female figure with a male heart, emphasizing that Mother Earth is able to have the power to punish and then to reward at the same time. Finally, we see an Egungu mask used to embody the soul of ancestors returning to the society, emphasizing the belief that the body is a mask. And at death, the soul leaves the mask. A human mask can be created as a substitute, as a surrogate for the body. And that is why during annual festivals, masks are used to incarnate the souls of returning ancestors. Note the emphasis on the face. Naturalism in Yoruba art signifies the body physical in flesh. Whereas stylization, the metaphysical body, emphasizing the dislocation of the soul from the body. So the Egungu attempts to provide a new body and then note the stylized uh, face, emphasizing the essence of humanity, rather than the specificity of a particular individual. So one can see an attempt 
to use a kind of call and response to ignite uh, you know, the mask. In fact, igniting in Yoruba culture means do when you dance, you are burning. There's a synergy in the body. And that is what we have here. So that during the performance of uh, the Egungu, the colors evoke the rainbow that recycles elements in the universe. And one sees uh, this attempt to make the spirit manifest. So that to the Yoruba, death is not a finality. It's only a separation of the soul from the body. So it is a victory of the human spirit over death. In fact, the Yoruba word, Ojutiku, shame and death, celebrates this belief that life is eternal. The body, the material body, is temporal. In fact, that tradition also survives in the US. In many parts, in fact, recently, the tradition is being revived in many parts. So remember, memorialize important people. And in fact, you can see here a Google for Duke Ellington. So we see in art an attempt to read the uh, uh, celestial phenomena and then use the knowledge to reinforce life and uh, sort of nurse the belief in a kind of life after, life uh, after death. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful, oh, fantastic. Thank you. thank you very much. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> wow, we've sort of been all over the planet now and in up and down. What I'd like to do now in our remaining time Oh yes, we don't have any. But yes, we're going to go for a little while longer <clears throat> and have some questions and answers. So I'm going to ask our speakers to come up onto the stage and we're going to pull some chairs out here. Uh, I apologize that Dr. Erton had another appointment that he had to go to, so he will not be joining us for this. And I want to remind you that <clears throat> if you want to ask a question, please use the microphone in the center of the room so that the uh, people out there in computer land and our webcasting audience can hear your question. Otherwise, it will be totally lost. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Would someone like to start with a question? I know you guys are dying to ask some stuff. Please go up to the microphone. Yes, that one right there. Oh, uh, hi, Stephen. Hi, Doug. Um, thank you all for a really exciting afternoon. It was uh, just wonderful to flip around between this place and the other place and all over the world. I really appreciate all the speakers. Um, I'm an archaeologist. I work in the Arctic, um, and I wanted to touch on another aspect of astronomy, which is meteorites. I know Mr. Price mentioned it briefly. Um, and in, in the Arctic, there was a famous meteorite fall, uh, which was iron rich, and so um, people traveled to get this meteorite um, to make tools out of it. But I'm wondering if, if any of the speakers had any other um, insights into um, th th those less... Um, permanent aspects of astronomy, but meteorites and comets, if, uh, if, if there was uh, native knowledge or, or observations or thoughts about uh, meteorites and comets. In 20 years of uh, interviewing Iglulik elders, uh, I can honestly say that there was no mention of comets. 
uh, very little mention of the planets. And, and I think there's a reason for that when the sky is unavailable for three or four months of the year because of the midnight sun or extended twilight. It's very difficult to observe, uh, observe uh, other features of the sky like planets or, or, or comets. I'll just, uh, I'll just mention that the, the planet Venus, uh, the, as far as I could see, that was recognized and it was called the, the great star, Urlureak uh, Joak. And we only had one interview in which, uh, as the planets, as their name implies, are, are wanderers. They're never, they're never. Uh, you, you can't really predict their uh, through, uh, let's say, basic observation. You can't really predict their their position in the sky. And I can remember one elder was extremely alarmed around Christmas time one year when Venus didn't uh, uh, appear in the sky. And she felt that uh, uh, perhaps uh, this had huge significance because she always asso associated Venus with the Christmas period. Uh, obviously, this was after the introduction of Christianity and the absence of Venus from the sky at a time she usually saw it uh, bothered her. With respect uh, to, uh, to meteorites, uh, uh, they have... Uh, uh, they, 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 they knew about, uh, they, they were called ingertok, uh, meaning they were really fiery, uh, and they distinguished them from shooting stars, which uh, to be polite about it were called, the, when they, they saw shooting stars, they said it was the stars defecating. Uh, but but uh, the m meteorites, uh, and I think uh, you were referring particularly to the to the ones in Greenland. Uh, th there was a long uh, history of these that uh, I won't go into now. But from the Iglulik uh, uh, point of view, meteorites were were recognised, but uh, uh, very little stories uh, connected with them. Thank you. Okay, the Yoruba regard the stars as irawo. Now, meteorites and uh, shooting stars are also called irawo. Yet, when you have a shooting star across the sky, some suspect that a great tree has fallen, an important person must have died. And if you check very well all over the Yoruba country, maybe an important person has died, one aspect. Then Venus is identified as Aguala, very close to the sun. And then Sirius is called Orisha Oko because of its use by fishermen at night for direction. Otherwise, all the other stars are just regarded as children of the moon as a result of some kind of um, marriage to the sun. In the Ojibwe tradition, the, the words that I've come across uh, for a, a, a shooting star is basically chingwen. And for meteorites, uh, are, are like uh, meteorite showers, um, the Ojibwe uh, came up with, a, or had a word called rain stars. Give me one anangug. So, and, and that, that's about all I know at this point. I'm, I'm still researching and asking questions about those names, but those are the two that I've come up with thus far. Other questions? I'm just wondering, because this is an astronomy um, like, uh, symposium, I'm curious about whether you have um, thoughts, theories, or actual facts um, about the upcoming December 21st, 2012. Um, astronomical lineup or whatever that is supposed to be occurring that day. <laughs> My other question was very mundane, is it that the city in South Carolina 
what is the, uh, the, that place in South Carolina? What is the large city near it? That is Sheldon. Okay. Sheldon in South Carolina. In fact, uh, between July and August, a lot of uh, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, who trace uh, ancestry to the Yoruba, congregate in Sheldon to celebrate the Yoruba heritage. In fact, there is a Yoruba village there where ancestors are remembered, there are masks, and the tradition is spreading to other parts of the Americas. And not only that, if you go to Brazil, in fact, time limitation did not allow me to show masking in Brazil, Shango Ellen monuments in Brazil, in the Caribbean, in Cuba, everywhere. So of course, people say, the world is becoming a village. Now, during the celebrations, even Anglo-Americans participate. Because of the Yoruba cosmology, which says the world started at Ife, and that both black and white left Ife. In fact, in the past, whenever white people visited Ife, they were greeted, welcome home. And that was what they did to the first enslavers. Only to be <laughs> enslaved later. Even the colonial masters were regarded as spirit beings. In fact, Batala is said to have created people in many colors, of many shapes. And that if we were, we were, we were all to look alike, either all beautiful or ugly, this world will be monotonous. And that is why it is necessary to have this variety of colors in humanity. Humanity is one. The material aspect of the body may differ in the interest of variety. Any of you guys want to take a shot at the other question? No, I, I don't. No, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I don't. I don't particularly know anything about that tradition. I, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Go to the microphone, please. Yes, I think the the closest uh, representative has already left. I think she's referring to the end of the Mayan long count on the twelfth. Um, that's a guess. I was well, wondering if that's what you were talking about. Yeah. Um, well. Uh, that gentleman had a question, though, before my question, if you wanted to come up. Oh. You're already um, there. So walking from the north to the south, uh, the transition of Orion in the far north means you get to sleep in daylight. The transition of Orion in Minnesota means spring roughly coming. I, I wasn't quite sure. I didn't know if you gentle people had the opportunity to track what certain transitions of constellations means as you move further south. I noted that the first speaker thought that the Pleiades were kind of the big thing, the big marker for seasons and so forth, but I would be personally curious to hear what is thought uh, among the Puebloan peoples or among the Apache who are kind of in between whether particular constellations mean a right Particular constellations rising and falling mean a particular thing. Planting time, harvest time, that sort of thing. If Dr. Erton were here, <clears throat> I think what he would say, because <clears throat> I read his book, <clears throat> is that our cultural, our understanding of the stars is always culturally based. And that cultural base, he argues, almost always comes down to food. You know, so we're using this to help us understand whether it's agricultural cycles, whether it's hunting cycles, or whatever. But he also makes the point, and this was sort of the question I had down here, is that the sky, to some extent, we can talk about the night sky as being kind of a cultural Rorschach, in which we see what we already understand. I mean, it helps us understand some things, but then there's also what we project onto it. 
I had an experience the other night. I can see a little bit of the northern sky from my apartment in Baltimore. And I can see the Big Dipper going around the North Star, and I can't see a whole lot else, and there's all this urban light that stops me from seeing a whole lot of stars, but I had a particularly clear night. I was like, oh, wow, I can see those, and I can see those. Gosh, I wonder what they are. I wish I knew my constellations, blah, 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 blah. And then having read Gary Erton's book, I said, I can just make up my own. <laughs> That's the big triangle. That's the big W over there. You know, it's why do I need somebody else's map? If I just look at the sky, I can make sense of it myself. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think that we will find, and it's an interesting question. I don't know if anyone has done that kind of comparative cultural astronomy, but that we would find that these things mean different things in different places, and it depends on their mode of production and all these other kinds of things. Pleiades is very important in a lot of cultures, which I find very interesting. Hawaiian culture, very important. Gentlemen? I've come across um, a story where the Hopi uh, Pueblos uh, look at Pleiades as a time to plant and a time to harvest, and they just happen to be at that particular latitude where you know their growing seasons correlate. Uh, but with the Pleiades, for us, being farther north, you know, that, that would not correlate. Well, for one thing, we're not agricultural, traditionally. But um, the Pleiades had, for us, a, a cosmological, and, and I didn't include that in my presentation. The Pleiades was a cosmological um, constellation called Bagunegizhik, which means the hole in the sky. And right about the time of the winter solstice, uh, the, the Bagunegizhik is almost overhead. And that is kind of a, a of an alignment of the four worlds of, of the Ojibwe, um, the four levels of the universe. So there, that's how come that the cedar tree is sacred to us because it is like a cosmological axis that aligns the world uh, with the Bhaganagishik, with the hole in the sky. So that's why we use cedar in, in our ceremonies. But it gets really complex when they start telling that story and I didn't feel totally confident in bringing that story here until I have learned more about uh, those teachings. Another little thing about the Pleiades in, again, in South America, there was a very interesting scientific study done where some scientist guy or whatever was out there and was told by the villagers that every year the certain group of elders goes to the certain mountaintop before dawn and watches for the rise of the Pleiades. And depending on what they see, that determines what the year is going to be like and when they should plant. And so this was just written down as one of these kind of cultural knowledge things, blah, 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 blah. And then the scientist guy said, all right, let me check this out. So he went and checked it out. And it had to do with uh, the density of the atmosphere and how that made the Pleiades appear which is in a sort of kind of farmer's almanac way, told them, okay, it's gonna be a wet year or a dry year. And that then determined, and he was able to document this and prove it scientifically, that they actually had science going on here. It wasn't just some kind of, I dare say the word, superstition. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that what we see in a lot of what we've talked about here is that there is deep cultural knowledge <clears throat> in all of these things that combines science uh, cultural understanding, psychology, a whole range of the human experience. Now, among the, the Yoruba, some astrologers, instead of looking at the sky, get a bowl of water to reflect the heavens. And it is from this bowl that the stars of certain individuals can be identified. So that if somebody is rich and famous, they say, Rawaminton, my star is shining. And then individuals will align, will be identifying a particular star with their own destiny. And when kings die, there are beliefs that certain stars will disappear from or recede back into space until a new king is installed. Of course, the body is a mask for mediating souls through reincarnation, through rites of passage. So stars are significant, but they're still children up there. 
subject to other forces. They are all ashe. Ashe is a power, it's a force in the universe, all emanating from a source. Uh, I'll just, uh, <clears throat> I, I th and this is going back a bit to the question. I think uh, uh, this point has been made before, but I think it's important to, to know and repeat that uh, the, uh, the constellations as we know them are not uh, always what other people see. So when it comes to Orion, Orion don't see, uh, excuse me, Ian, uh, Inuit don't see Orion in the same in the same sense that we do. It's broken up. Uh, uh, the, the three main stars in Orion, the, the ones that I explained, the runners, they're just separated out of that to be a constellation that's actually linked with the Hyades and also uh, with the, uh, the major star Aldebaran. Uh, similarly, the other two stars that we're familiar with in Orion, that's Betelgeuse and Bellatrix, uh, they're ones uh, that are completely different uh, constellation or asterism, as you might call it, within Inuit culture. And uh, these are called Akutuyuk because of their separation. They mean two, two, two stars apart. Uh, and I'll just make a very quick point about uh, the, the gathering of uh, astronomical information these days from uh, lesser known peoples. And this, this is the huge amount of uh, acculturation that native astronomies are undergoing. Uh, I did some interviews in communities in northern Quebec, uh, uh, near the Labrador coast, and I heard to my astonishment that they referred to the Big Dipper as Kadluti. And I said, I always thought it was uh, Tuktogjuit, meaning the caribou. And this uh, middle-aged uh, uh, lady said, no, it's, uh, it's Kadluti. And I said, well, when you translate that, it means dipper. So I said, where did you first learn that it was called Kadluti? And she said, uh, an Anglican minister, when I was very young, came into our house uh, in, a, in a dark night and said, uh, it, it was beautiful, clear tonight, and I looked up to the sky and I could see Kadluti. And uh, that's how she learned it. So, through the back door, all our uh, acculturations creep in and begin to uh, really infect and affect uh, native cultural astronomies. Thanks. I'm afraid I have been given the time up signal, but uh, so I'm going to end the formal discussion and hope that those of you who have further questions will stick around and discuss with us. And I apologize for that. <laughs> Thank you to all of our speakers and to the National Museum of African Art for their initiating the uh, African Art Stellar Cosmos project. I would just like to say in closing, you know, one of the things that we've seen here is that you know, we take the sky as a constant, and geologically speaking over time it's not really, but for our purposes it pretty much is, except that it differs what you see from one latitude to the next. And we've heard some stories here where stars are in fact ancestors, or when you die you become a star, and I would just like to suggest that stars and the stories, the associated artifacts in the landscape uh, that have been described by some of our speakers here actually are a means by which our ancestors communicate with the people of today, conveying knowledge and ideas. Thank you very much. <laughs>